Hey everyone, before we begin, I want to say that this story is in no way an endorsement of J.K. Rowling's beliefs, nor an encouragement to purchase any of her products. Trans rights are human rights. We open on Halloween night, 1981, in the wreckage of the Potter Cottage, as a flying motorcycle touches down. After finding Wormtail's hideout deserted, Sirius had rushed here, hoping his fears were unfounded, only to find the house in ruins and no signs of life. Bursting through the door, Sirius cries for James and Lily, though to his horror, the only response he gets is the sight of James's dead body, sprawled across the landing. Tears run down Sirius' face at this, though knowing Prongs would want him to look after his family first, the long-haired man continues on, bounding up the stairs and calling for Lily in the hope that she and Harry at least survived. Tragically, this is only half right, as when Sirius steps into the nursery, it does not take him long to spot the body of Lily slumped against the crib. The only relief comes in the form of what lies behind Lily, Baby Harry, bleeding from the head and red-faced from crying, but alive, mercifully alive. Grabbing Harry in his arms, Sirius holds his godson close, wiping his head clean and cooing that everything will be alright in the way he'd seen James and Lily do while visiting them. Recognizing Sirius on some infantile level, Harry allows himself to nestle into the man's chest, gurgling softly as he is rocked and comforted, with the pair staying this way until Harry finally drifts off to sleep. Gathering up whatever supplies he thinks a baby might need, Sirius returns to his bike with Harry still in his arms, then with one last mournful glance back at the place James and Lily died, takes off into the sky, silently promising to make good on his godfatherly duties and protect Harry with his life. The first challenge to this promise comes a few hours later back at Sirius' place. After transfiguring his old school trunk into a crib and getting Harry settled, Sirius is seated watching over the boy when his intruder charm alerts him to the arrival of an unexpected guest. Instinctively drawing his wand, Sirius demands to know who's there, only to be greeted by the figure of Albus Dumbledore, who despite the terrible events of the night, looks entirely serene. In his usual placid voice, Dumbledore comments that he sees Sirius as Harry. He thought this might be the case when Hagrid told him the baby was missing. Hearing the unspoken accusation in Dumbledore's words, Sirius replies that he's Harry's godfather, so he's simply doing his job by looking after the boy. Though fixing Sirius with those piercing ice blue eyes of his, Dumbledore adds that he was also Lily and James' secret keeper. Flaring up now, Sirius barks that he didn't sell James and Lily to Voldemort, if that's what the old man's insinuating. Though still serene, Dumbledore retorts that someone did, as Lord Voldemort was able to breach the Fidelius charm. At these words, a dark rage fills Sirius, and before he can stop himself, he furiously hisses the word, Wormtail. Cocking his head, Dumbledore asks if Sirius would care to explain, with the younger man elaborating how he convinced James Lily to switch secret keeps from him to Pettigrew, since he figured that way he could act as a decoy, while Voldemort would never suspect a worthless git like Wormtail of being the secret keeper. The only problem is, he failed to suspect him of being a spy for the same reason. He should have known. Wormtail's always been the sort of guy who gravitates towards power, so of course it hedges bets by playing both sides. It's so obvious in hindsight, but even still, he didn't see it. And because of that, James and Lily are... Reaching out a comforting hand, Dumbledore tells Sirius that he knows the pain of blaming oneself for the death of a loved one, though he also knows that it does not do to dwell on the past, not when there is the future to consider, specifically the future of young Harry. Looking Dumbledore in the eyes, Sirius firmly states that he'll look after him, it's what James and Lily wanted, and he's got the means to make sure Harry will want for nothing. However, here Dumbledore frowns, saying that be that as it may, he believes the best course of action is to give Harry to the care of Lily's sister Petunia, since their bond of blood will give Harry added protection that no one else can. Wrinkling his nose, Sirius tells the old man he's out of his bloody mind. Lily told him all about Petunia, and there's no way she'd be a better guardian than he would. As he says this, his slackened grip on his wand goes taut again, a gesture that is not lost on Dumbledore, as he coyly asks if Sirius really intends to duel him over Harry. Gritting his teeth, Sirius replies that he will if he must, though instead of growing hostile, this caused the old headmaster to raise his hands and shrug that he supposes there is nothing he can do about it then. Both men know that this is a lie, as while Sirius is a prodigy, no wizard can compare to Albus Dumbledore, though they are also both wise enough to know that if Sirius would face unbeatable odds for Harry, there is nothing he would not do, making him a worthy guardian for the boy. With the matter of Harry's caretaker now resolved, it comes time to focus on the more practical and pressing matters. First and foremost is making sure that little rat Pettigrew does not escape, with Dumbledore dispatching Moody and the Longbottoms to bring him in. This does require Sirius to reveal that he and Wormtail are unregistered animagi, though this is a small price to pay if it will ensure the man who sold James and Lily to Voldemort does not get away. As for Sirius's place, Dumbledore insists that it be fitted with a number of protective spells to ensure that none of Voldemort's old followers can attempt to finish the job their vanquished master started. Sirius has 
no objections to this, even adding a few of his own that he knows will put on his childhood home in Grimold Place, meaning that before long, Sirius's flat is arguably the best protected home in Britain, with the only building capable of surpassing it being Hogwarts. This is not the only adjustment Sirius must make though, as while he is willing to take on a parental role for Harry, it does not mean that he is prepared, often struggling in the early days and wondering how James and Lily made it look so easy. Luckily, Sirius is not alone, as while most of his blood family would rather spit on him than help him, he does have one true brother left in the form of Remus Lupin. When Lupin comes to offer his assistance, Sirius can hardly look at him, feeling tremendous guilt for assuming he was Voldemort's spy. Though as ever Lupin is the most level-headed marauder, recognising that his suspicion was born from a desire to keep the Potters safe and forgiving his old friend immediately. Another olive branch comes in the form of Sirius' cousin Andromeda, who knows the struggles of parenting all too well having a young daughter of her own. As a result, she becomes a frequent guest and even occasional babysitter for Harry, with this deepening her and Sirius' relationship, while also allowing her daughter Nymphadora to develop a cute bond of her own with her uncle Sirius and cousin Harry. Unfortunately, the trials of parenting are not the only ones Sirius must overcome, as even after hearing of Pettigrew's capture and subsequent life sentence in Azkaban, he cannot get over the guilt he feels for his role in Pettigrew's betrayal. Each night he dreams of James and Lily, replaying the moment he suggested they put their trust in Wormtail. The moment he handed that traitor everything he needed to sell the Potters to Voldemort. Were it not for his responsibility to look after Harry, Sirius knows he would have hunted Pettigrew down himself, and killed him long before the Auras could have gotten a hold of him. But after failing James and Lily once, he has no intention of doing so again, which means at least for now, Pettigrew gets to live, no matter how much the thought causes his blood to boil. Luckily, whenever his grief and anger grow too great, he has one remedy, transforming into a dog and curling up in front of Harry's crib. The baby always giggles with delight when he sees Sirius' shaggy canine form, gripping handfuls of his thick black fur and gently patting his head. At times Sirius wonders if Harry actually likes him better as a dog. Hardly surprising considering how James had joked more than once that he should remain this way permanently, though all the same, it does his heart good to see Harry smile. Thankfully, this is a common occurrence over the years that follow, with Sirius making it one of his top priorities to ensure that Harry grows up in a place that feels like home, having experienced firsthand what it's like to be deprived of parental love and affection. As a result, he and Harry develop a deep father-son bond, with Harry filling the hole in Sirius' heart that James left behind, while in turn, Sirius becomes whatever Harry needs him to be, serving as protector, confidant, guide, friend, and above all the person most devoted to this child in all the world. As Harry grows, Sirius also shares the stories of his adventures with James and the other Marauders, encouraging the boys' more rebellious instincts, much to the chagrin of Lupin, who has made himself a near-permanent house guest at this point. Unfortunately, these are not the only stories Sirius and Lupin have to tell Harry, as one day when the boy is six, he asks the question the pair have been waiting for, the question of what happened to his parents. Refusing to lie to Harry, Sirius recounts the events of James and Lily's death as best he can, though he freely admits that much of what happened that night are a mystery. Understandably, this is a lot for a six-year-old to process, though being a bright kid, Harry eventually makes his peace with it, returning to his usual inquisitive ways before long, much to Sirius's pride. When Harry gets a bit older, Sirius also begins giving him some rudimentary magic training, allowing Harry to use his wand, and relying on the imprecise nature of the trace to conceal their flagrant flaunting of the decree for the reasonable restriction of underage sorcery. Consequently, by the time Harry receives his Hogwarts letter when he is 11 years old, he is already equipped with a few useful spells, having learned Expelliarmus from Lupin, who figured that if Harry's going to start learning early, he might as well learn something that can keep him safe, and Alohomora from Sirius, for if he decides to do any extracurricular exploration. To further facilitate this, Sirius also gifts Harry with the Marauder's Map, having unknowingly stolen it from the Weasley twins with a summoning charm. This greatly excites Harry, having heard all about the map's creation and the many creative uses Messrs Mooney, Wormtails, Padfoot and Prongs had put it to during their tenure as students. Nonetheless, Lupin as the voice of reason in young Harry's life urges him to not actively seek out trouble, reminding the boy that they had the advantage of being nobodies, whereas Harry is people who genuinely wish to do him harm, so he must keep an eye out for danger. Scoffing, Sirius retorts that Remus is starting to sound like Mad-Eye with his whole CONSTANT VIGILANCE shtick. But chuckling lightly, Lupin reminds his old pal Padfoot that his knack for attentiveness got them out of a number of sticky situations, both during the war and at school. 
Speaking of school, it is finally time to get Harry his school supplies, with Sirius and Lupin accompanying the boy to Diagon Alley. Due to having spent his whole life in the Wizarding World, this is not Harry's first time visiting the alley, though this particular trip does come with a few new experiences, such as Harry's first visit to Ollivander's. Like in canon, he still purchases the Holly and Phoenix Feather Wand, though when it comes time to get a birthday present, Sirius buys Harry a particularly intelligent orange cat named Crookshanks. Truthfully, Sirius had wanted to get him a Nimbus 2000, but Remus had talked him out of it, since as a first year Harry wouldn't be able to take it with him anyway. Following this, September 1st rolls around in the blink of an eye, with it finally being time for Harry to head to Hogwarts. Due to having Sirius to see him off, he has no trouble locating Platform 9 and 3 quarters, though all the same the pair are almost late, as fitting all of Harry's belongings onto the back of the bike proves harder than Sirius had anticipated. Subsequently, they arrive at the same time as the Weasleys, with the red-haired family being awed at the sight of the boy who lived. Good-naturedly, Sirius encourages Harry to introduce himself, with the boy quickly getting to know the Weasley family, and even striking up an easy friendship with Ron when he learns they're going to be in the same year. To this end, the two younger boys decide to share a compartment on the Hogwarts Express so they can get to know each other better, with them bidding their respective parental figures goodbye as they clamber onto the train. However, before Harry can go, Sirius does have one last gift for him, one half of the old two-way mirror he and James used to use as kids. He then explains how to activate it, promising that night or day if Harry ever needs to talk to him, all he needs to do is speak his name into the mirror, and he will be there. Giving his godfather a hug, Harry thanks him for this, then with Crookshanks in his arms and Ron standing behind him, he boards the Hogwarts Express, ready for a year of adventure. For the most part, the train ride is uneventful, with Harry and Ron getting to know each other over a selection of sweets courtesy of Harry. As he doesn't have a pet of his own, Ron expresses envy over Crookshanks, though when the cat promptly curls up in his lap and falls asleep, trapping him in his seat, he quickly gets over this. Partway through the journey, the two boys find themselves with a pair of uninvited guests. First a bushy-haired girl who only stays long enough to ask about a toad, and then a pale blonde boy with a supercilious smirk upon his face. Recognising Harry at once, the blonde boy introduces himself as Draco Malfoy before beginning a speech on how Harry would do well to make friends with the right kind of wizards. However, before he can get through the first sentence, Harry promptly tells him to sod off, having heard all about his family from Sirius. Flushing an ugly pink, Malfoy begins to protest that Harry has no right to speak about his family that way, though once more Harry interrupts him, saying the other boy mustn't have heard him, he told him to sod off, before whipping out his wand and using it to slam the compartment door in Draco's face. This act amuses Ron to no end, with the two boys laughing about the look on Malfoy's face all the way to Hogsmeade Station. However, when they arrive, something new comes along to draw their attention. Or rather, someone, as waiting on the platform is a giant of a man, with wild hair and a beard, who calls for all the first years to assemble around him. On closer inspection, Harry is pretty sure he saw this man in passing when he, Sirius, and Lupin went to Diagon Alley. Not that he'd be likely to mistake him for someone else, considering his immense size. When the first years are all assembled, the bearded giant introduces himself as Hagrid, before beckoning the kids to join him in a set of magical rowboats. Climbing into a boat with Ron and two other boys, Harry soon finds himself drifting across a vast lake, until suddenly a massive castle the likes of which he's never seen before blooms out of the evening mist. Looking at Ron and his fellow boatmates, Harry realises that he is not the only one who is amazed, and as Hagrid looks back at the first years with a broad grin, he welcomes them all to Hogwarts. A few minutes later, the boats all dock underneath the castle, with Hagrid leading the first years up into some sort of entrance hall, where a stern-looking woman is there to meet them. In a curt voice, she introduces herself as Professor McGonagall, before giving the new students a rundown of the houses and the sorting ceremony they're about to undertake. Then, when she is done, she leads them into the Great Hall. Lining up between the vast house tables beneath the ceiling which mirrors the sky, the first years watch as a patched old wizard's hat is brought out. One by one, the kids are then brought up, and the hat is placed on their head, with it assigning them each a Hogwarts house. For some, this takes a while, such as with Neville Longbottom, while with others like Draco Malfoy, the hat barely touches his head before it is screaming out of house. Finally, it comes time for Harry to step up, and as the sorting hat falls over his eyes, he hears a voice in his head commenting on the difficulty of placing the boy. Musingly, the hat quickly starts to turn in favour of Slytherin, though remembering all the stories Sirius told him about his awful pure-blood supremacist family, Harry pleads with the hat not to stick him there, saying he wants to be a Gryffindor, like his parents and Sirius and Remus. This earns him a chuckle from the hat, though with a huff, he concedes that if that's the case, it might as well place him in... Gryffindor! Thunderous applause ring out as Harry takes his place at the Gryffindor table, with Ron joining him a little while later. After this, it is only a short wait for the sorting to finish and the feast to begin. Though Harry has had no shortage of good food growing up, this is still the best thing he's ever eaten, with him eating happily until he can't eat any more. 
When the meal is done, Dumbledore then rises to give his opening speech, and while most is standard boilerplate, one comment does catch Harry's ear, that being the warning about the third floor corridor. To one who grew up on the tales of the Marauders, this is too good an opportunity to pass up, and so when they have all been ushered up to Gryffindor Tower, he decides to check it out. Pulling out the Marauder's map, Harry wastes no time in locating the aforementioned spot, though to his surprise, he sees nothing there except a small room at the end. Figuring that this will require some on-the-ground investigation, Harry invites Ron to join him, with a red-headed boy showing some hesitation, though in the end he agrees, when his curiosity gets the better of him. As a result, when the candles all dim and the others go to bed, Harry and Ron slip back out the portrait hole, with Crookshanks coming with them to act as a lookout. By using the map, the two boys and their feline friend are able to avoid Filch, Peeves and Mrs. Norris, as they slip in and out of classrooms and secret passages until they finally make it to the third floor corridor. Whipping out his wand, Harry then proceeds to use a low homora to unlock the heavy door before pushing it open. However, what he sees inside is far from anything he could have imagined. A giant three-headed dog who is staring back at him with hunger in its six eyes. Then, the silence is broken as the beast begins to bark, and knowing that this will draw Filch in no time, the boys scarper, their hearts pounding in their chests until they are safely back in their beds. For the rest of the night and into the next morning, Harry and Ron can think of nothing but the strange dog, with them fearing they won't be able to focus on their classes. Fortunately, Professor McGonagall finds a way to sufficiently challenge them, so that by the end of her lesson, the dog is little more than a thought buzzing in the back of their heads. This remains the way for the rest of the week, with most of the classes presenting their own challenges, be they academically difficult like charms, or just difficult to stay awake in like History of Magic. However, as the boys will soon learn, none is more trying than potions with Professor Snape. Having heard all about Snape from Sirius and Lupin, Harry is already negatively predisposed to him when the black-clad man flaps into his dungeon, looking like an oversized bat. Though it seems the feeling is mutual, as in his sneering voice, he wastes no time in quizzing Harry on subjects he could not know. Naturally, Harry is unable to answer, resulting in his humiliation in front of the class. Though truthfully, Harry doesn't much care what a greasy big-nosed git thinks of him, even telling Ron as much when Snape turns his back to write the instructions for today's potion on the blackboard. Unfortunately, Snape isn't the only enemy Harry has in this class, as Gryffindor and Slytherin take potions together, making this Harry's first encounter with Malfoy since the train. As if united by their hatred of Harry, Snape and Malfoy get on great, with the potions master showing the blonde boy immediate favoritism, granting him house points for the slightest thing, while likewise taking them from Harry for the mildest of infractions. Luckily, he only has to deal with Snape and Malfoy in that one class, otherwise being able to avoid both of them. That is until the end of his second week at Hogwarts, when a notice goes up informing the Gryffindor first years that they will be doing flying lessons with the Slytherins. Though Harry has had plenty of practice flying with Sirius, and is actually quite good at it, he still attends the lesson. And it is fortunate that he does, as after one of his dorm mates, Neville Longbottom, has an accident, Malfoy attempts to steal his rememberal while the teacher, Madame Hooch, is away. Loathing this sort of bullying behaviour, Harry does not hesitate to chase the blonde boy down, regardless of Madame Hooch's warning. And though he does recover the orb for Neville, he is met by a white-faced Professor McGonagall when he lands. Grabbing him by the hand, McGonagall then drags Harry back into the castle, though here Harry does not come quietly, protesting that he was just looking out for a fellow Gryffindor. Curtly, McGonagall replies that she knows that, that is why she is not punishing him, instead they are going to meet Wood. Curiously, Harry asks who Wood is, though with no expression to give away her intentions, McGonagall replies that Harry will soon see. Not long after this, the pair find themselves outside the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, as McGonagall requests a moment with Mr. Wood. Subsequently, a fifth-year boy emerges, with McGonagall introducing him as Oliver Wood, captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team, before informing Wood that she's found him his new seeker. This claim caused both Harry and Wood's eyes to light up, and seeing how happy both boys are, McGonagall leaves them to talk, though as she goes, she gives the two one of her rare smiles. That night at dinner, Ron is amazed that Harry not only weaseled his way out of trouble, but was given a spot on the house Quidditch team in his first year. However, it seems not everyone is amused, as the girl from the train, Hermione Granger, feels that rule breaking should not be rewarded, while a livid Malfoy storms over the Gryffindor table to tell Harry that he only got away with this because he's famous. Haughtily, Harry retorts the blonde's just mad because he's a better flyer, though when Malfoy challenges him to back up his ego with a duel, he is quick to accept. After some brief discussion, it is decided they will meet at midnight in the trophy room, though in actuality, this never comes to pass, as when Harry pulls out the Marauder's map to check for Filch as he prepares to sneak out of Gryffindor Tower, he finds Malfoy still in the Slytherin dungeons, while the caretaker and his cat are suspiciously staking out the trophy room. Recognizing this for a trap, Harry decides to stay in his dorm, and it is good that he does, as the next morning on the way to breakfast, he overhears Filch yelling at Malfoy for trying to prank him by giving him false information. 
However, Malfoy getting in trouble is not the best thing to happen that morning, as when the outburst arrives, Harry finds himself with a long thin package that looks remarkably like a broom. Choosing to read the card first, he discovers that it's from Sirius, congratulating him on making the team and revealing that in spite of what Mooney had said, he had gone back to buy Harry the Nimbus, with plans to send it to him at Christmas. Barely able to believe what he is reading, Harry with help from Ron and a few other Gryffindors then begin to rip the package open, and good to Sirius' word, they soon find themselves staring at a genuine Nimbus 2000 racing broom. While this is not Harry's first broom, it is still a step up from anything he has ever owned or even seen before, and so not wanting to be damaged or stolen, Harry immediately returns to Gryffindor Tower to store it. While there, he also uses his mirror to call Sirius and thank him for the gift, with the long-haired man beaming that it was his absolute pleasure. The pair then chat amiably for a time, with Harry filling Sirius in on his first few weeks at school, while Sirius in turn tells Harry of his own adventures since the boy left. Unfortunately, they cannot talk as long as they would like, since Harry does have classes to attend, though before he goes, Sirius does make it to congratulate Harry one last time on making the Gryffindor team, saying that he knows if James were here, he would be so proud. This comment stays with Harry for the rest of the day, filling him with pride at the thought of living up to his dad's legacy, so much so that he can barely wait for that afternoon and his first training session. Here he is at last introduced to the rest of the team, since with him already knowing about Quidditch from his upbringing in the Wizarding World, this is a normal practice. Thanks to both his Nimbus and his natural affinity for flying, Harry is quick to make a good impression with his teammates, with Fred and George Weasley commenting they think he might be an even better seeker than their brother Charlie, while Wood beams that with Harry as their secret weapon, the Quidditch Cup is as good as theirs. Subsequently, Harry adds these practices to his schedule, spending three nights a week on the Quidditch pitch on top of all his homework and other studies. As a result, the following weeks seem to pass in a blur, with it being Halloween before Harry knows it. On the morning of Halloween, Professor Flitwick the Charms Master teaches the first years how to levitate objects with the spell Wingardium Leviosa, a difficult feat that only Hermione gets right on the first try. While this by itself would be a good thing, she then attempts to correct the technique of her classmates, with Ron in particular taking offense at her condescending manner and even griping to Harry about her after class. Unfortunately, Hermione overhears this, causing her to run away in tears with the boys learning she still hasn't come out of the girls' bathroom at dinner time. This is a particular shame as that night's dinner is the Halloween feast, though before the festivities can get into full swing, they are interrupted by the arrival of Professor Quirrell, who screams there is a troll in the dungeon, then promptly faints. At once, the prefects begin ushering the younger students back to their common room so the teachers can sort out this troll problem, though as Harry and Ron rise to their feet, they both have a horrible realisation that Hermione doesn't know about the troll, so they've got to warn her. Using the chaos to their advantage, the two boys then duck into a secret passage where they can pull out the Marauders map. Scanning it, the pair soon find Hermione's dot being one of the few that is not clustered together, though to their surprise, they also find two other outliers, both seemingly headed for the third floor corridor. The first is none other than Snape, with him being the closest to their destination, while the other is a name Harry and Ron can't make out, with the letters above it being all garbled, as if multiple names have been written over each other. While this is certainly odd, it is hardly Harry and Ron's top priority, as they quickly find the troll on the map, and to make matters worse, it is on a collision course with Hermione. Rushing to save their classmate, the boys find that they are already too late, as the troll's rampage is in full swing, though fortunately, a particularly stupid troll is no match for three resourceful Gryffindors. Working together, the trio quickly manage to subdue the interloper, with Ron even performing Wingardium Leviosa successfully to lift the troll's club into the air, then drop it on its head, knocking it out. It is only now that the teachers arrive, with Professor McGonagall scolding Harry and Ron for disobeying instructions to return to their common room. However, here Hermione steps in, taking the blame and earning their friendship, with the trio becoming inseparable from this point forward. Over the next few weeks, Harry and Ron benefit immensely from Hermione's friendship, as her intelligence makes their studies much easier, while in turn they help her to loosen up a little, even if she does remain fairly stiff when it comes to rules and homework. One of the benefits of Hermione's friendship is that she acts as a grounding force for the boys, similar to Remus's role for James and Sirius, something Harry can see the value in, even if he does not always agree with her. Nonetheless, he is happy to have her in his corner the morning of his first Quidditch match, as she and Ron wish him luck and promise to cheer him on from the stands. From here the game goes the same as canon, with Snape seemingly attempting to jinx Harry midway through until Hermione sets his robes ablaze, allowing Harry to get back on his broom and catch, or rather swallow the snitch, winning the match for Gryffindor. This victory is met with an uproarious celebration from the Gryffindors, though truthfully, Harry is not even noticed, as he has a private celebration of his own to enjoy. Due to this being his first ever Quidditch game, Sirius, Remus and even the Tonks family have come to Hogwarts to watch, with Cousin Dora having marked the occasion by turning her hair crimson and gold to show her support for Gryffindor. Harry is delighted to see everyone, introducing them to Ron and Hermione and debriefing them all about the match. 
Everyone is of course effusive with their praise, though eventually the mood does take a turn when they reach the matter of the bucking broom. Here Ron and Hermione waste no time in naming Snape as the culprit, forcing Remus to hold Sirius back as he declares that he's gonna hex Snivellus into pieces for trying to hurt his godson. Reasonably, Lupin suggests that perhaps there is another explanation, asking the kids what proof they have, and when they explain that Snape was keeping intense eye contact with Harry while muttering under his breath, Lupin agrees that this is suspicious, though they would do well to avoid jumping to conclusions. He also promises to take this up with Dumbledore, an off which seems to put everyone's mind at ease, even if Sirius still wants to jinx Snape at least once as a precaution. During this visit, Harry also brings up the anomaly with the Marauders map, showing it to Sirius and Lupin, who are surprised to see the garbled names they've never had a problem such as this before. Briefly, Lupin wonders if perhaps the map is simply degrading with age, as it has been many years since it was made, so maybe the magic's fading, though Sirius brusquely refutes this, reminding his old friend of the spells they put in place to avoid that very outcome, saying it must be something else. To this end, he asks Harry if he can take the map home with him and study it a bit more closely, a request Harry is happy to grant if it will allow him to get to the bottom of this mystery. Following the Quidditch match, life gets back to normal, or at least as normal as things can be at Hogwarts, with Harry, Ron and Hermione working hard for the remainder of their first semester. Before they know it, it is time for the Christmas holidays, with Hermione going home to her parents, while Harry and Ron head to Sirius's place. Due to Molly and Arthur having decided to visit their son Charlie in Romania, Ron had originally been slated to stay at Hogwarts, though when Sirius had heard this from Harry, he had invited the other boy to join them, remembering how much he had treasured spending holidays with the Potters growing up. As a result, it is a party of seven who celebrate Christmas at Sirius's flat, with Remus naturally being present, while Dora, Andromeda and Ted Tonks all drop in for Christmas lunch. When the meal is done, it comes time to start handing out presents, with Harry receiving an assortment of candy from Ron and Hermione, a servicing kit for his Nimbus 2000 from Sirius, a copy of Quidditch Through the Ages from Remus, a Gryffindor banner that roars when waved from the Tonkses, and a selection of Zonko's products from Dora, which she laughingly tells Harry she has no doubt he'll find a use for. Finally, Harry finds himself down to one last package, which no one claims credit for. Looking at the card, he finds only an anonymous message stating that his father left this item in the sender's possession and they are merely returning it. Now immensely curious to see what this item might be, Harry unwraps the gift, only to find a swath of the most smooth and supple material he's ever felt. At once, both Sirius and Lupin's eyes go wide, causing Harry to ask what's wrong, though when the men answer, it is with broad smiles as they declare that this is Prongs' old invisibility cloak. Looking at the cloak with new eyes, Harry can hardly believe what he's hearing. This piece of cloth is really the famous invisibility cloak his dad and the other marauders used to sneak throughout the school and even Hogsmeade? Having heard a few of these stories from Harry and now Sirius, Ron eagerly urges Harry to try it on, and grinning from ear to ear, the bespectacled boy does as he's told, wrapping the cloak around himself and immediately vanishing. Taking Ron's subsequent gasp of bloody hell as a sign of success, Harry then throws off the cloak, with a redhead boy asking if he can have a turn. Handing the cloak to Ron, Harry then goes over to join Sirius and Lupin, asking if they have any idea who sent him the cloak, to which Sirius reveals that he actually does, saying that Lily once told him that James had lent his cloak to Dumbledore around the time they all went into hiding, meaning there was probably him who wrote that note. Furrowing his brow, Lupin wonders why Dumbledore would return the cloak now of all times, though here neither Harry nor Sirius have a clue, with the question soon being forgotten as the festivities continue. The rest of the Christmas break is spent in similarly high spirits, with Harry almost being disappointed when it comes time for him and Ron to return to school. Nonetheless, on the day before term is set to begin again, he bids goodbye to Sirius and Remus and heads off for King's Cross to catch the Hogwarts Express. However, before he can go, Sirius pulls Harry aside, saying there's something very important he has to tell him. Joining his godfather in a secluded alcove, Harry listens as Sirius explains that following their discussion of the Quidditch match, he's been keeping an eye on the Marauder's map, and while he still can't read the jumbled name, he has made two discoveries about their mystery person. First, that they are often in close proximity with Snape, and second, that when they aren't hanging around that greasy git, they spend a lot of time in the third floor corridor Harry told him about from his first night at Hogwarts. This comes as something of a shock to the boy, wondering what anyone could possibly want with that place, though here Sirius can be of no help, glibly stating that he can see two possibilities. Either they're that dog's keeper coming around to play a friendly game of fetch, or there is more to the beast than meets the eyes. For the rest of the train ride that follows, these words stay with Harry, with the boy finding himself in deep thought. There must be some connection between Snape the dog and their mystery figure, though for the life of him, he can't guess what it might be. This leads him to one conclusion and one conclusion alone. He needs to get another look at the third floor corridor.
Seeing no reason to dawdle, Harry endeavours to check it out that night, a feat made much easier by the invisibility cloak, even if he no longer has the map. Knowing to risk Harry being attacked by the dog or caught by Filch, Ron and Hermione agree to go with him, with the three of them bunching together under the cloak as they go to investigate. By the time they reach the corridor, it is nearly midnight, with the dog being asleep as the trio creep into its chamber. For the most part, it appears to be a normal room, though after a moment, Hermione points out the unusual feature of this place, that being the large trap door the dog is sleeping on. This at last gives them a clue to its function, with the trio concluding that it is some sort of guard dog, though what it is guarding still eludes them, as they dare not try to open the door, lest they wake the beast. Unfortunately, without this answer, there is little Harry, Ron, and Hermione can do beyond speculating wildly, their guesses ranging from a magical weapon that could wipe out all of wizard kind to Dumbledore's sock collection. Thankfully, in early March, they receive a break in the case, as after Gryffindor flattens Hufflepuff at Quidditch, Harry overhears something while returning his Nimbus 2000 to the broom shed. Specifically, what he overhears is the sound of Snape's voice from inside the Forbidden Forest, and though he can't quite make out the words, he can make out the threatening tone. Flying in the direction of the sound, Harry soon sees that Snape appears to be interrogating Professor Quirrell about whether he knows a way past the dog so he can get at the Philosopher's Stone. Though Harry doesn't know what this is, it doesn't take a genius to surmise that this must be what's behind the trapdoor, and so when he returns to Gryffindor Tower ten minutes later, it is to inform his friends of his discovery. Thanks to Hermione's skill as a researcher, it does not take the trio long to learn all the Hogwarts Library can tell them about the Philosopher's Stone, with them quickly concluding that Snape and his unknown accomplice must want to steal the stone so they can make use of its ability to turn any object into gold to get rich. Though currently they are unable to retrieve it because Quirrell is standing in their way. While it is a little difficult to imagine wimpy Quirrell standing up to anyone, let alone Snape, they suppose his stories of fighting off vampires during his time abroad must be true, meaning that as it stands, the skinny turban clad man is their best hope for foiling Snape's plans. Naturally, Harry also confides this information to Sirius, with the long-haired man growling that it stands to reason Snape would want to go after the stone, revealing that he used to work for Voldemort, and that even though Dumbledore claims he switched sides before the war ended, Sirius himself never believed it, and has always suspected Snape's just been biding his time and playing nice to stay out of Azkaban. This all but confirms Harry's suspicion, with him promising to tail Snape, though wisely, Sirius encourages him not to, saying that if the ex-Death Eater figures that Harry and his friends are onto him, he might try to silence them permanently, so they can't go to Dumbledore or the Ministry. Better they keep an eye on him with the map, that way they're not in danger. To this end, Sirius sends the Marauder's map back to Harry the next day, with the boy and his friends using every spare moment to check it for signs that Snape or his ally are on the move. However, to their surprise, neither villain does anything out of the ordinary, with the days quickly stretching into weeks with no sign of trouble, meaning Quirrell must be holding strong. As a result, other matters soon take precedence in the trio's lives, such as their upcoming final exams, with Hermione being quite insistent the boys put their focus into studying so they aren't forced to repeat the first year. Nonetheless, Harry does still like to keep an eye on the map from time to time, and it is good that he does, as on the afternoon of his final history of magic exam, he spots something odd, the person with the illegible name entering the third floor corridor, then vanishing. At once he feels a sudden prickling pain in his scar, and as he presses a hand against it to soothe the pain, he knows that Snape and his ally have finally put their plan to steal the stone into motion. Wasting no time, Harry, Ron, and Hermione make a beeline for Dumbledore's office, intent on telling the headmaster everything, though there is one slight problem with this. None of them know where Dumbledore's office is. However, on the upside, the trio do manage to find someone who does, with that being Professor McGonagall. Still in a heightened state of agitation, Harry insists that she take them to Dumbledore's office, though with a quirked eyebrow, as if asking where this boy gets off demanding anything of her, she informs him that Professor Dumbledore was recently called away to the Ministry of Magic, and so is unavailable. Cursing quietly under his breath, Harry then decides to throw caution to the wind, confiding everything in McGonagall, from his discovery of the stone to his suspicions regarding Snape and his unknown collaborator. For a moment, no one speaks. Then in a low voice, McGonagall tells Harry that while it is clear he has picked up his father and godfather's dislike for Professor Snape, there is no chance that he is a threat to the stone, so he would do well to put these wild accusations out of his mind. She then departs without another word, though truthfully, Harry doesn't care, as her message is clear, no one is going to believe him, which means he, Ron, and Hermione will have to protect the stone on their own. Subsequently, when the trio return to Gryffindor Tower, it is simply so they can gather up the invisibility cloak and a few other supplies before setting off for the third floor corridor. 
As expected, the three-headed dog is awake when they arrive, though being invisible it cannot detect them, meaning it does not immediately attack. This gives Harry just the time he needs to pull out the banner he got from Aunt Drum and Uncle Ted and wave it under the cloak, causing a realistic lion's roar to fill the room. Being a notorious coward, the dog backs away with a whimper, and using this opportunity, Harry passes the banner to his friends to keep waving, then leaps from under the cloak and down through the trapdoor. For a moment, Harry finds himself in freefall, then with a wettish flump, he lands on something soft. By the look of things, he must have fallen a great distance, as the square of light up above which must be the trapdoor is a little bigger than a stamp. Peering down through the trapdoor, Ron yells out, asking Harry if he's okay, and when the black-haired boy responds that it's a soft landing, he jumps, followed shortly by Hermione. As they both come to a stop, Ron wonders aloud what they've just landed on, though it seems Hermione knows, as she gasps at his devil's snare, backing away when its tendrils attempt to get a hold of her. Looking down, Harry and Ron both see they've already been caught by the creepers, meaning it's up to Hermione to save them. Unfortunately, it seems this crisis has left their friend rather flustered, as while she quickly recalls the Devil's Snare is vulnerable to fire, she forgets that she can use magic to create flames, until Ron snaps at her, at which point she conjures a couple of her famous bluebell flames, driving off the vines and allowing the trio to escape this chamber. Stepping into the next room, the team are met by a most peculiar sight, hundreds of winged keys soaring through the air. Spotting a set of brooms, Harry grins, feeling that this challenge will be right up his alley, though there remains one problem, figuring out which key to catch. Thankfully, Hermione's intelligence proves to be their saving grace once again, as she rather astutely points out that one key is a bent wing, suggesting Snape's ally already caught it, making it the one they need. This is all Harry needs to hear, and so taking off into the air, he proves once again why he is the youngest seeker in a century, swiftly catching the key and using it to unlock the door. The room that follows is different once again, with it being a life-size chessboard. Quickly, the kids discover that in order to cross, they must assume the role of chess pieces and checkmate the opposing king. Luckily, Ron is something of a chess prodigy, with him directing Harry, Hermione and all the other pieces. While he does a good job in keeping his friends safe, the youngest Weasley son soon reaches an unfortunate conclusion. They can win this, though he will have to be taken. Desperately, Harry and Hermione beg Ron not to sacrifice himself, though in a resolute tone, he explains that it's the only way, before expressing his faith in his friends and stepping forward. In response, the opposing queen strikes the boy, dealing him a serious injury, though as predicted, it allows Harry to checkmate the king, securing their passage. Looking concerned, Harry and Hermione ask Ron if he's okay, though staying strong, he tells them to go on without him, a request the pair reluctantly grant. Following this, the next room is something of an anti-climax, containing an already unconscious troll, having clearly been felled by Snape's ally, meaning that all it's left to do is move on to Snape's own puzzle, the last puzzle guarding the Philosopher's Stone. As it turns out, Snape's puzzle is a riddle, with seven differently shaped bottles all lined up on a table, and though she hates to admit it, Hermione calls this brilliant, citing how this challenge relies on logic more than magic. Fortunately, Hermione has both in spades, quickly solving the riddle and revealing that in order to advance, Harry must drink a specific potion. However, herein lies the rub, as there is very little of this potion left, with Snape's ally having already drunk most of it, meaning Harry will have to continue on alone. Looking Hermione in the eyes, Harry urges her to go back and help Ron, while in turn, she tells him to be safe. Then as one, they each drink the respective potions they need, then part ways. Stepping into the final room, Harry is met by several surprises. First off, there is no sign of the stone, with the only notable feature being a large mirror, and second, the person staring into it is none other than Quirrell. Unable to help himself, Harry gasps that he can't believe he's Snape's ally, though this only seems to amuse the turban-clad man, as he sneers that Harry's wrong. Snape was never trying to steal the stone. In fact, he was trying to protect it, just like he was trying to protect Harry from him at the Quidditch match. Fortunately, Snape isn't here now, meaning he can achieve both his master's objectives in one fell swoop. As Quirrell monologues, Harry begins looking around, trying to figure out what the puzzle of this room is, and how he is meant to retrieve the stone, though despite his best efforts, all he can see is a reflection of himself in the mirror. Something about this strikes Harry as odd, though he can't quite put his finger on it, until suddenly he realises the only thing in the mirror is him, not Quirrell, despite the man standing right in front of it. Taking a step closer to get a better look, Harry soon sees that his reflection is smiling, something the real him most certainly is not doing. Then with a wink, it deposits something red and shining in his pocket, causing Harry to feel a weight form in his own pocket, seemingly out of nowhere. 
However, before Harry can check if his hunch is correct and he has really just been given the stone, Quirrell's raised voice draws his attention as he demands Harry tell him what he's just seen in the mirror. Not knowing the mirror's true ability, Harry simply replies that all he sees is a reflection, an obvious lie, which a new voice wastes no time in calling out. Something about this voice causes Harry's scar to prickle more, though as he looks for the source, he sees only Quirrell's turban. Then, as if on cue, the defense against the dark arts professor begins unwrapping it, revealing a second face. Without having to be told, Harry knows exactly who this is, and as the hateful red eyes bore into him, he also knows why he was unable to read Quirrell's name on the Marauder's map, because it had another name overlaid directly on top of it. Lord Voldemort. Acting on instinct, Harry runs, though with a hiss, Voldemort commands Quirrell to follow him. Running backwards, the two-faced man then attempts to grab hold of Harry's arm, though as soon as they make contact, he lets out an agonized scream. Looking down at Quirrell's hand, Harry sees that it's blistering, as if placed directly into a fire, and so trusting his gut, he reaches out, grabbing the man's face and listening as his flesh sizzles. Unfortunately, this contact with Voldemort's vessel comes at a cost, as the pain in Harry's scar has gone from prickling to an inferno of agony, and though he tries to hold on, he soon finds himself blacking out from the pain. The next thing Harry knows, he is lying in a soft bed while afternoon sunlight kisses his face. Looking around, he quickly realizes that he is in the hospital wing, with a large black dog curled up at the foot of his bed and Professor Dumbledore sitting by his bedside. As soon as the pair see that he is awake, they spring into action, with Dumbledore bidding Harry good morning while Sirius returns to his human form and hugs his godson. Suddenly, the memories of the mirror chamber come flooding in, with Harry gasping that he can't be lying around since Quirrell's probably got the stone by now. Though chuckling serenely, Dumbledore assures Harry that he need not worry about that, as Quirrell most assuredly does not have the stone, considering how he is dead. Still a bit dazed, Harry asks what happened, with the headmaster replying that due to Lily's sacrifice, it seems Lord Voldemort cannot touch Harry, meaning that when they came into contact, Quirrell's body was destroyed and Voldemort was forced to flee once more. However, Harry isn't quite out of questions yet, as he next asks what became of the stone then, though here too Dumbledore simply smiles, saying that it has been destroyed, meaning the danger is truly past. He then prepares to depart, urging Sirius to join him, as Madame Pomfrey is none too fond of the Animagus for the way he growled at her when she tried to shoo him out of the hospital wing. Though, before he can go, Harry does have one last question. Why did Voldemort try to kill him all those years ago? This at last gives the old man pause, as he briefly weighs his options. Then, with a slight shake of his head, he states he's afraid he can't tell him. Or at least, not yet. Following this, Harry's recovery goes smoothly, with him receiving visits from Ron, Hermione, and the rest of his friends on the Quidditch team, all of whom are glad to see that he's okay. Eventually, even Madame Pomfrey accepts that he is well enough to be discharged, meaning that he is able to attend the end of year feast with everyone else. Unfortunately, when he arrives, Harry is disheartened to see the Great Hall done up in the green and silver of Slytherin, as it seems they have won the House Cup again. However, appearances can be deceiving, as during his closing speech, Dumbledore decides to award some last minute points, specifically to Ron, Hermione and Harry, for their actions in protecting the Philosopher's Stone. Thanks to having never lost Gryffindor any points for attempting to smuggle Hagrid's dragon away, these additions are more than enough to tip the scales in their favour, meaning that as Harry's first year comes to a close, it is amidst the cheers that Gryffindor has won the House Cup. And that's where we'll leave things for now. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.